Hey everybody, Robert Hunt, ArtTop10.com and here I am in London outside Tate Britain and I'm about to head into the press view of the biggest rehang they've had of this collection for 10 years. And here we are, strolling through Tate Britain. The rehang galleries are laid out chronologically from the 1500s to the present day and each room has a distinct wall, colour, title and theme. Okay, so the galleries on this side of the building cover the period 1545 to 1940 in chronological order. You're joining the story in the 1920s. So this must be the 1920s, this bit. Slightly confused how it's a rehang. I came here the other week and it looks exactly the same. Um, unless they've painted the walls a different colour. Um, anyway, let's, let's just have a look at some of the nice things. There you go. Beautiful Barbara Hepworth. Look at that. I love those chunky, chunky hands. Absolutely amazing. Use direct carving to make her work. I mean, she just carved it basically. Um, this is a method where the artist chips away at the stone in order to reveal the work. That's an interesting comment because I mean, that implies she knew that was in there, which is actually quite a philosophical discussion about whether she knew that form was inside it or, or whether she. I mean, did she allow the piece of stone to inspire to find that shape? Winifred Nickson, Winifred Nicholson, Ben Nicholson's first wife. The next one was obviously, obviously then married Barbara Hepworth. Who did that sculpture? Um, I really like these paintings by Winifred Nicholson. Look at that beautiful colours around here at the top. Those sort of gentle greys and greens. It's really cool. I mean, I love all these things. You've got a lovely Alfred Wallace up there at the top. Alfred Wallace, obviously, sort of naive, painted, discovered, I think, by um, Ben Nicholson, possibly, and Christopher Wood. And then they both started doing these kind of simpler paintings. I'm painting with Christopher Wood's really good, actually. I really looked at it in detail before. It's really nice. I love the colours in the heads of the people. Got such beautiful colours there. You've got a really St. Ives, obviously, but you've got a really nice sort of jumble of buildings on the left hand side and the men with the boats. And then over here you've got a much busier kind of section with the uh, the, um, the masts of the ships. It's really cool. So this is the 1920s in this rehung version of Tate. Britain. Now, what's in here? So this is the 1920s as well, or not? 1930 to 1940. This is international modern. Okay, so lots of lovely pieces in here. Oh, that's a nice Ben Nicholson. Look at that white relief sculpture. I really like these, like uh, Ben Nicholson's these sculptures. Look at that. That's, that's so similar to his actual paintings, but in a 3D shape on wooden base. It's carved as one of only two known surviving sculptures by Ben Nicholson because he did quite a lot of 3D works with wood so I suppose you could say that that wasn't specifically a uh, the 3D pieces aren't sculpture I could say. Winifred Nicholson, this is quite interesting, I never knew Winifred Nicholson did abstracts. The title of the work refers to Winifred Nicholson's own address in Paris where she lived from 32 to 38. Interesting colour and light. Absolutely fascinating. And that's quite Ben nicholson -y. although I can't believe he would have ever used an egg shape. Um, Marlow Moss, white and yellow. Member of the Abstract Creation Group in Paris. Proud of mathematical principles when making geometric abstract work, such as this one. Made with string and canvas. Oh, I didn't realise there was string. But yeah, these bits are like wire kind of string on them, which is quite intriguing. This is a wonderful one, isn't it? This is a big Ben Nicholson. I mean, you can see the size. If I spin around, it's a really nice big one here. Look at that. That must be uh, oil on canvas, I am guessing. Oil on panel on canvas. He painted abstract works from 1933, but only started producing purely geometric works from 1935 after he visited Pierre Mondrian studio in Paris. These are all, you would have said, very highly influenced by Mondrian. Not that that's a bad thing. But I really like this um, Barbara I always think it's stunning. So beautiful just with these three little forms. 
In 1934, Barbara Hepworth changed her approach to abstraction and began to focus on pure form. Here she reduces the sculpture to simple shapes, removing any visible marks or colours from the stone. She was absorbed in the relationships in space and size and texture and weight, as well as the tensions between forms. And all that the shape of the three elements is different from each other, they are precisely proportional to each other. I can't understand what that means. Are they exactly half the size of the other one? Not entirely sure, but I, I remember her talking about how these shapes were like family, like, you know, you've got a mother, father, and a child, which I think is quite interesting if you look at those things in that way. So, I seem to be the only person wandering around these sections of the uh, press view, which is slightly bizarre. I think there's a talk that probably everybody else has gone off to. Maybe we'll try and see what that talk says in a minute. Oh man, these are nice though. I've got to say, it's quite nice just to be able to wander around here without anybody galloping around. Um, look at that. That's a cool sculpture, especially against that crazy abstract picture in the back. Is that David Bomberg? It's quite interesting. I didn't realise he did quite abstract things as well. David Bomberg's triangular blocks of colour ripple across the painting's canvas in an interpretation of dock workers loading cargo onto a ship. <laughs> Very cool. I like that one. 1910 to 1920 we're now in. In the years leading up to war, a new generation of British experimental artists emerged who challenged traditional artistic practices. I think the one thing you got to say is that it's actually a really good collection of stuff here. Um, Really good collection of stuff. I didn't realise just how good it was actually. Maybe they've just dug out more of it because I'm sure they've got a huge amount in storage. Only Matisse, that's a great Matisse painting, isn't it? What is it that makes that so good? Based on a photograph. Um, published in a magazine, put with artists, the magazine allowed us to substitute life drawing classes for a set of posed nude photographs. Hmm. Challenge traditional studio nudes. You've got that classic Matisse, pink and green, which is always amazing, but what is it about that figure that is so... I mean, you feel it should all be wrong, those heavy blacks, but something about it is sort of sculpturally monumental and strange and the scruffiness of the painting and yet it's look at it all scrubbed up down here around the bottom and these bits there but somehow it's still really satisfying matthew smith 1879 oh that's quite intriguing these things are all around the same amount of time and that's quite a strange striking painting as well isn't it the reds and the greens makes me think of Air Jordan shoes. Vanessa Bar, Studland Beach. It's quite enigmatic that picture, isn't it? I can't see anybody's faces, everybody's backs facing you. They often, Vanessa Bell and her family often visited Sutherland Beach Dorset. It's an exercise in what our friends, the art critics Clive Bell and Roger Fry called significant form. When bold colour and simplified shape and line are emphasised over the subject itself. Described as one of the most radical works of the time in England. Extraordinary. I wouldn't have thought of that now. However, the picture still retains some of the feel of a holiday by the sea. <laughs> Intriguing, isn't it? Intriguing. That was described as one of the most radical works of the time. Director's Welcome will be taking place out there in a few minutes. Look at this. Who's that by? This is Degar. Intriguing. Philip Wilson Steer. Seated nude. Philip Wilson Steer often posts his nudes in everyday settings. Here the model sits in his studio wearing a hat and holding out some clothing. Steer did not exhibit this painting because friends thought it indecent that a nude should be wearing a hat. The reason why the hat is offensive is not immediately obvious to it today, but is likely to centre on the distinction between a naked figure being depicted as naturally nude and the process of getting undressed with its suggestions of immorality at the time. Quite intriguing. 
where are we now? Room of One's Own, 1890 to 1915. Oh, these are cracking paintings by Gwen John. Even though I, I can't tell if I have been here before with this hang or not, but I'm actually rather enjoying it in reality. I think these rooms around the side are amazing. Oh, look at Harold Gilman. I mean, look how beautifully that's painted. All those soft, soft colours and little bits of white left in there. Absolutely stunning. You just don't, don't really get people painting anymore these days. That's a voyard. Interesting. I'm slightly confused about whether or not these are meant to be British paintings or just stuff. I mean, I don't mean stuff, I mean, it's clearly not all British, is it? It's Vuillard's French. Um, and I suppose Edward Vuillard's paintings were highly influential on the early 20th century British painters, so it fits historically into that kind of um, thing, explaining what they came up with. Spencer Gore, look at that, another beautifully painted thing. Look at that lovely curtain in the background. I love stuff like that curtain got separate beautiful different colours in there and the blouse is a kind of slightly different blue but relates to that curtain in the back okay I think this talk's about to happen but I'm just gonna while it's quite quiet I'm just gonna keep wandering on through these rooms because I think it's quite interesting it's a nice time to actually be able to film all this without hundreds of people appearing Anne Swinnerton. Absolutely extraordinary. I've never even heard of Anne Swinnerton. This display celebrates Anne Swinnerton's trailblazing work as a painter and campaigner for women's rights, 1844. Interesting. In 1922, Swinnerton was elected to the Royal Academy of Arts. She was the first woman member since its founding in 1768. Sorry, Laura Knight, look at these extraordinary paintings. Laura Knight, 1877-1970, followed Swinnerton to this bastion of the British art establishment. She paid tribute to Swinnerton. Any woman reaching the heights in the fine arts had been almost unknown until Mrs. Swinnerton came and broke down the barriers of prejudice. Intriguing. Courage calls to courage everywhere. Jillian Waring, <laughs> 1963. This is Waring's model for her statue in Parliament Square of Fawcett, one of Britain's most influential, influential suffragettes. It includes the portraits of 58 women and men who campaigned for women's suffrage, honouring the collective nature of the campaign. Quite fascinating to look at this, actually, which is something that was done in 2018, which is deeply historical, um, talking about what's happened before. And then even the paintings by this woman, who was deeply influential in changing everything. I mean, are they? They're not historical in that fashion. They're just paintings, are they? Or am I... I mean, is that right, or am I missing something desperately there? Um, studied in a home city in Manchester School of Art, became frustrated by the limited curriculum it offered. Women students were prevented from working from new models. She was involved with the fight for women's political rights during the Manchester Society of Women's Suffrage in 1880. Her citizen supporters included leading figures in the women's suffrage movement. So, interesting. Is there a historical... What I'm trying to say, is there a deeper narrative? Because, like, contemporary works like this one here by Julian Waring are just utterly drenched in narrative. There's, I mean, it's, it's the most boring sculpture on earth, isn't it? It's just a woman holding a gold flag on a podium. I mean, there's nothing... I mean, you're not going to say that is visually, artistically interesting, I don't think, are you? I mean, it's all about the narrative, 100%. Courage calls to courage everywhere, yeah, that's, that's cool. It's interesting, it's striking, it's... I mean, it's, it's narrative interesting. Visually, it's utterly pointless. Obviously, what I'm trying to say is, even though 
uh, the woman here and Swinerton was fighting for women's suffrage. She also created reasonably beautiful paintings um, while keeping some historical and narrative comment in it. Um, says his, she's, her work kept his distinct character as diverse as mythological painter Edward Byrne James. Very interesting. Anyway, if you want to, please put in the comments below. What I'm intrigued is, do you prefer these more visually intriguing works that explain something? And also maybe have some historical relevance, or do you prefer like the contemporary piece of art that visually isn't really there, it's just literally a narrative with a thing stuck on it to um, get you to look. Now, I think we're going to wander out here and see if we can see any of this talk that's meant to be happening somewhere. Right, so we wander on, potentially to find this talk. I'm just going to film up a bit of what we find on the way. Okay, so we've, okay, it's like a confusing fashion. We've drifted from the older works to much more contemporary stuff for about 18 seconds. God, like this painting over here. I wonder who that's by. Fucking get up to it. It's a bit of abstract stuff. Is that by Rachel Jones? Uh, it's oil stick. Use an oil stick to create an intensity of pigment. Her fiery reds clash with fleshy pinks and sharp lines. So these are much more contemporary. It's actually quite nice, that painting. Can't quite tell it's an oil stick in reality. I've used those oil sticks, they are so messy. Um, literally, you would need a lot of <laughs> mess to control that. Here is a big machine. Um, oh, here we go. Oh, this is the state we're in now. So this is 2000 to now. The final room in the five century story of British art. Features artists of different generations working in Britain today. Some are going some in the 1980s, while the youngest are in those 20s. These are photos. So what else you got in here as we stroll on down? Oh, weird sea escape that slightly unnerving in all honesty. Um Libana Himid HMS Calcutta. Really unnerving seascape, I don't know why. It's something to do with the size of it and the way it, the horizon is so high up. I think it's what was unnerving. You feel really deep down in it. Wolfgang Dillman is the state we're in. Inch it on paper. Photograph captures the stretch of the Atlantic Ocean from the end of a pier in Porto, Portugal. The sea is dark, its surface agitated. This combines with the imposing skill of the work, gives the work a feeling of foreboding. The title is a reference to global political tensions and speaks to Brexit, the migration crisis and the rising global sea level caused by the climate emergency. It's part of Wolfgang Tillman's four-year project making digital photographs in five continents. Oh, I feel really dizzy for a moment. Probably was being a bit mean about that painting. Um, that's a good, uh, it's a good photo, but I mean, once again, narrative outweighs the product. Does it? I don't know, I think it is a good photograph. And the rest of the stuff is just rubbish. I mean, not that it's not Brexit there, but I mean, it's just, it's a cool photograph. He's wedged those on it just to make it relevant, because otherwise nobody's going to exhibit it. Right, Oscar Murillo, born 1986, that's weird. Lives in London, made this painting in his hometown of Columbia. I was slightly confused about that, so I thought Oscar Murillo was somebody else. Uh, from years ago. Anyway, that's this room. It is the most up-to-date room. So it's quite clever. I've got a good historical thing. I wonder what goes on down this little corridor. Um, right. oh, down here. 
got a oh here we go oh these are that's quite interesting they've got a good collection of stuff i mean you got a nice peter doig when i was at art school it was like oh peter doig so amazing um and I guess still he's one of, you know, the foremost contemporary artists ever known to mankind. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's not bad, is it? Um, Echo Lake. I of several paintings by Peter Doig based on a still from the horror film Friday the 13th. I mean, it's kind of nicely painted, I guess. The guy's really weird. Really weird little guy in the centre. What I, I don't know, this is an awful thing to say, but would you really want it at home? Um... Probably not, is my answer. It's just kind of odd. Do you want a sort of relatively pretty painting of a horror film at home? I just don't know. I mean, probably people be horrified by saying, do you want it at home? But I do think, I don't think art should just exist um, in art galleries, personally. I think it should exist. A place where you can see it every day and you see more and more in it every day. Um, Arby Katai, his paintings are always quite interesting. It's oil paint on canvas. I always manage to have a really sort of dry feeling to that paint. Um, you see David Hockney there in that top right hand corner. He was a friend of David Hockney. Um, over here, this must be a painting by Lucian Freud, which is quite striking even from a distance, isn't it? Lee Bowery, who painted loads of times. You got that obvious Lucian Freud fleshy, fleshy vibe going onto it. They have all that thick, thick paint sponged over the canvas. I mean, uh, and you got to give it Lucian Freud. He's an amazing painter. You see, you could argue, would well, you want that at home? In that, yeah, you want something. Like, I mean, when I say at home, what I really mean is something you can really examine constantly. So I think it's interesting to have art at home. It changes the way you think all the time. How much is that going to change the way you think on a daily basis? Whereas I think that Lucian Freud is going to change the way you look at things all the time. I think it would. It would do something every day, make you think more. Subtab Biswas, born in Bengal, India, lives in London. A drawing. And I do like these Chrysophiles. No woman, no cry. I think it's uh, this is a tribute to Stephen Lawrence. I think these paintings are absolutely stunning, actually. And I really love the way you've got these little dots all over it. you got that resin, and you've got these little kind of maybe even like photographic things buried in there. And you've got the elephant dung it's laid on, which is obviously probably got a lot of excitement, everybody jibbery-jabbering about that, but beyond the elephant dung, you've actually got a really, really good painting. Okay, this is, uh, I know we've had a slightly weird tour that I've gone from all those older paintings suddenly over the side of them. I was looking for that talk, obviously, which I never found. Um, and we are now in No Such Thing Society, 1980 to 1990. Actually, the, the way it's laid out, stuff, it's actually genuinely quite interesting. I suppose partly because I was into art and the art school all around this sort of time and everything going on. Um, artists of the 1980s explore the experience of the land and the body to reflect on their own identities and sense of belonging. Who's that by? Oh, Rita Donna. I don't know what it is. We're really madly dizzy in here today. These things stuck on the wall. These guys lying on the floor. This weird thing over here with um, it looks like blood being pumped around. Donald Rodery, visceral canker. The left-hand plaque displays the coat of arms of John Hawkins, the first English slave trader. On the right, the royal arms of Queen Elizabeth I, the hell linked to tubes and pumps, circulating artificial blood. He wanted to use his own blood to show his connection to the enslaved black members of John Hawkins' coat of arms. Oh, that is pretty awful, actually. Those people on his coat of arms. 
probably need to find canker or something evil that spreads and corrupts. Quite interesting, isn't it, actually? It is extraordinary. You did actually have those... Well, you still have those slaves on his coat of arms. <laughs> I guess the connection is maybe that the Queen is still... Well, was embroiled in this slavery as well. Um, just wanted to have a quick look at this Damien Hurst thing for everybody, but everybody's having their photos taken with it at the moment, which is making it harder to look at. But yeah, there you go, one of his sheep. Okay, so the gallery is open to the public in four minutes, which as far as I can see means not meant to be filming after that, I guess, in case I accidentally film some human. But um, let me just stroll, I just want to stroll back to these older rooms and my slightly chaotic exploration. But um, all I've got to say is it's actually pretty cool. I actually rather enjoyed coming around today. Partly enjoyed it just because there's absolutely nobody here, which made it so much quieter and simpler to look at all the pictures but um, I think it's a really interesting I do like the historical element of it where are we now Ooh, I can't find the date in here but look I just want to give you a quick glimpse Frederick Layton this dude fighting with his snake Frederick Layton bronze interesting to have all these similar kind of pictures gathered together I and mean, you could almost come here and spend you know a few hours in each room just going through that history I've got to say I actually do quite like the historical works put together it's quite interesting so let's just see how the arts evolved over that time where are we now the cost of war what is this 1776 to 1833 here we are now Very cool. Let's keep on strolling. So literally I'm just giving you a whirlwind tour of what else there is here. Cool sculpture. Whip on down here. 1776 to 1833 is the thing I just said. And we are in here. This is 1760 to 1830. Interesting. And now where have we got to? Oh wow, what a crazily densely packed room. It's quite fun. That is probably how they would have hung these things years ago. Completely mental. But kind of really cool. Quite interesting. And here we are here into what's the dates in here I can't find it on the whistle stop tour of the new hang metropolis 1720 to 1760 <laughs> court years versus parliament this is 1640 to 1720 oh, crazy building sculptures Oh, now where have we got to? Ah, oh, man, it's quite a weird, surreal whisk through the world, here. Huh? 1545 to 1640. Check it out. A couple of suitcases, just to make sure nobody forgets it's a contemporary universe. Um, interesting. Interesting. Now I think this is the first room. Exiles and dynasties. Really fancy actually, even after I've finished just walking through the yeah, a really weird whisk through history. So this must be that bit must be where it's meant to start there. Which is kind of cool. And I think there's probably just one couple of rooms I've missed. I'm gonna see if I can whip back and grab a little film of them before this place fully opens. Alright, so this is on the last few rooms. Francis Bacon and Henry Moore, so that's just the two of these dudes. I think we're kind of really out of time. I haven't quite got every bit of it. Um, down to these more recent sections. Henry Moore again. 
And I just wanted to try and capture each room. A little sweeping through here. What date's this? I'll find the dates in here. I 65 to 1980. And then I think once we get into here, you've pretty much got a good vibe of the whole thing. Because this one will take you into one of the David Hockney bits. This is 1960, 1970. So I think we're good. That's pretty much the whole vibe of the thing we've got. So outside uh, Tate Britain, uh, just going to do the summing up of the uh, exhibition here. As um, I think I was meant to stop filming inside at uh, 10 o'clock, and uh, the gallery is open to the public. Um, Overall, absolutely fascinating. Thought it was actually really, really good. Slightly confused whether it is a rehang. As I came here a few weeks ago, and it seemed to be exactly the same. But um, anyway, maybe the rehang's been taking place over months or something. Um, and I guess they can't shut the whole thing when they change it. Um, anyway, that aside, I found it absolutely fascinating to go around and see the different change in the histories, and you could see all from the earliest sort of 1540s right up to the present day. Uh, that was actually really, really good. And um, this is just a stunning collection of art in there. Actually really, really decent. Um, so yeah, I would definitely go and see it. It's great to see it historically. At the very end, I just walked around the whole way through very quickly, just from the sort of earliest to the most recent bits. And it's, it's a really interesting journey to see how the art has changed. And you can actually go back and spend a long time looking at that. So I would thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Actually, I've forgotten just how good the collection of art is here at Tate Britain, which I think is just one of the most wonderful galleries in London. So yeah, head here and have a look at the exhibition. And yeah, enjoy that historical journey you can take. As ever, like and subscribe for more um, uh, art exhibition reviews and interviews with artists. Have a good day. Bye-bye.